You guys seem to really like this video on England's floating ships and this one about Australia, so I thought I'd go along the same lines and hit you with a bit more depressing history from the British Empire. Today I want to talk about Canada's quarantine island for immigrants. We've all experienced a quarantine or lockdown of some sort due to a certain disease this year, and so this one might be a little bit more relatable to us now. We're looking at the mid-19th century, where diseases, not only the common flu, but typhoid, cholera, and many more deadly illnesses were spreading. There are no vaccines or really any concrete scientific knowledge about these types of diseases. Remember, Canada is still a part of the British Empire at this time, and a whole boatload of immigrants are regularly arriving from Europe. Canadian officials decided that they needed a buffer zone. This began as part of a bill passed by Lower Canada in 1832 to form a quarantine station for all incoming newcomers. They were primarily concerned about a cholera pandemic that had swept across India and had reached the British Isles, which was where a majority of Canada's incomers were originating. Located in the middle of the St. Lawrence River is Grosse Isle, and I'm so sorry about my French pronunciation throughout this video. There were a few other parts out in the Atlantic regions, but the St. Lawrence is the major river that connects the Atlantic to the inland provinces, and so this became the quarantine station for all immigrants entering inland Canada from 1832 up until 1932. The boats would land at Grosse Isle if they had sickness aboard, and they would kick the passengers off and quarantine them on the island for a bit. The understanding of disease at this time was not as scientific as our own, and they knew that when people were sick it was best not to touch them, and they primarily believed in bad air, or what they called miasma, or invisible sick particles. Hence the idea that quarantine would be a good idea, keep them separate from the mainland population and it is less likely to be spread. But unfortunately they also lacked the science to discover exactly what a quarantine should look like and the length of time that it would require. Sometimes a ship that had a sickness would take all of the sick people away and just make the healthy people stay on the ship for a few weeks to see if they actually got sick. They wouldn't clean the ship, however, or remove them from all the bacteria likely left everywhere. Somebody eventually caught on, and they did begin to clean the ships and air out any of those bad particles in the air that would be left. With slower incubation periods for some types of diseases than others, many immigrants were also let go a little too soon whilst they were still healthy, and ended up spreading typhus around Quebec, and indeed wherever else they travelled from there. Many of the presumed healthy that were let free weren't healthy at all and it was probably harder to tell if they were sick because they weren't really being taken care of anyway. That first year happened to be the biggest year for immigration yet, with 50,000 incomers reported. And with the influx of people, probably pure chaos from this new system, People slipped through the cracks, and that year Quebec had its own major cholera outbreak with over 4,000 dead. Operations began to slowly improve and more permanent accommodations were built on the island. In 1845, Ireland suffered from the famous potato famine, and at this point in time the Irish population had also boomed from 4 to 8 million in under 50 years. They were unable to keep up with the new demand for food, especially without their staple crop. This led to a huge wave of immigration from Ireland, specifically to North America. In this year, over 100,000 immigrants reached the port of Quebec, seeking new homes and new lives, over 90% of whom were Irish. The journey across the ocean was not an easy trip either. It was during this three-month voyage that you would discover if you were seasick or sick with fever, and in such an overcrowded and dirty voyage, disease spread rapidly. Over 20% of passengers had died before reaching their final destination. It was a harrowing journey for so many immigrant families in this time. More and more ships began to see the cases of disease and death building up during this journey, and they had to report the illnesses to the authorities. All ships with sickness were required to dock a grosse eel before being permitted to land and disembark on the mainland. They took all of the passengers off the ship and inspected their health, 
The sick would be treated in hospitals on the island, and the healthy would have to wait in quarantine on the island to see if they start developing any symptoms. But they were often quickly cleared as healthy, just to kind of get them off their hands. These ships were dubbed famine ships. The annual report from Dr. Douglas, the medical superintendent of Grosse Isle, for the year of 1847, states that before May of 1847, the hospital had increased supplies, as he thought necessary, in anticipation for the large and sickly immigration. But admittedly, they were unprepared for what kind of numbers to expect. At the time, the hospital accommodation was sufficient for 200. On May 17th, the first famine ship arrived, bringing with it 84 struck with fever and nine dead bodies. Within nine days, the number of sick amounted to 530. In another week, it increased to 1,200. As more and more ships arrived, a queue began to form, and the longer that they were left on the ship, the worse the spread got. If up to a quarter were infected when they arrived, almost half were certain to be infected by the time that they docked. These ships were left without much support with medical officials, left without medicine, nourishment or guidance on what to do with their rotting bodies, many of which were just left to await burial on land. By May 31st of 1847, 40 ships were anchored off the coast of Grosse Isle. Unable to dock because the island was already full, 12,500 passengers were centrally trapped and left for dead. These were dubbed the coffin ships. Not that it was much better on the island. The hospitals were ill-equipped, certainly not sanitised, and lacked proper space to quarantine the sick from the healthy once they arrived. They knew that keeping people in overcrowded dirty ships was bad, but then they were moved to overcrowded dirty makeshift tents to live out on the island. They didn't even have enough food or fresh water to go around. In his report, Dr. Douglas notes the attempts to improve accommodation. Eight separate hospitals for receiving the sick were constructed, and he stated that they were capable of accommodating three to 4,000 people in tents. He wrote that the accommodation was so vast, a multitude of fever cases in one place generated a miasma so virulent and concentrated that few who came within its poisonous atmosphere escaped. And he was right. All of the workers at the hospital all either became ill or exhausted by fatigue, and they had a very hard time retaining any nurses or attendants to stay and work. Those sent to replace them were often the lowest classes who would volunteer for the job. A common reaction to this horrific situation was to blame the Irish. Letters sent out from 1848 to Herman Merrivale, who was the British Undersecretary to the Colonies, noted that out of 7,500 German settlers who arrived this season, there was not during the voyage or on arrival as many sick as usually found in the like number of the same class. And they said the same with other English ships. None of these ships from English ports had such sicknesses that were found on ships who had Irish passengers. They also noted that the mortality of last year's immigration was caused neither by want of food on the voyage nor by overcrowding, but by the presence of latent infection among the emigrants when they embarked. Really, they were basically shifting any blame onto the origin of the disease and away from grosse eel or factors found on the ship itself, causing it to spread. We can only blame the Irish who brought the disease here. Now, we can easily look back on history and critique their actions with the knowledge that they had, the resources that they had, and of course the social discrimination that was at play. But I'm just here to tell you the facts and let you do all of the silent judging. Still, medicines and treatment for the sick had a long way to go, and based on what they were seeing from the death rates, it was still essential to keep Grosse Isle and its operations in place as a quarantine. In 1848, they established zoning on the island to more appropriately place the sick away from the healthy and a place to receive incoming ships. But really, the crisis only eased when the large influx of immigrants eased. In 1869, Grosse Isle became an innovative facility, 
incorporating the best techniques and new sanitation procedures of its time. This was under the direction of Dr. Frederick Motizambert, the new medical superintendent. By 1886, ships were routinely cleaned and disinfected, and in 1893, they had a disinfection building to handle the incoming passengers, their luggage and the sanitation process. In 1902, the station received a vaccination and a medical inspection office, a laboratory and hotels for the passengers awaiting release. The island also had churches built for numerous sectors and schools built. In the early 20th century, immigrants started to arrive to Canada by many other parts, and the effect of the quarantine zone was no longer viable. Grosse Ile really had no purpose anymore, and it was no longer in use by 1932. During World War II, the deserted island was used by the Department of National Defence to research germ warfare, specifically experiments with anthrax. In 1956, it returned to its roots and was used for quarantining animals for a while. Later, it was declared a National Historic Site by the Canadian government in 1974, as some of its buildings still stand, and the island really has become a time capsule for its original purpose. A Celtic cross was erected in 1909 to commemorate the Irish immigrants who died there, and the ones who never made it. 7,000 people are buried on the island, about 5,500 of whom are victims specifically from 1847. One significant recorded impact we see is the increase in Irish orphans in Quebec, many of whom were taken in by local parishes and eventually placed in foster homes and adopted by French-Canadian families. Many of these orphans kept their Irish surnames, allowing many families to be able to trace back their ancestry all the way to the very tragic beginnings in Canada. This may be due to French families who wanted to preserve their heritage, or may just be because they were never formally adopted or just treated as a type of home child, who were immigrant children generally placed in homes to help assist with chores and running rural farms. Some of these orphanages kept detailed records of these children and their parents' names and origins, but not everyone did so, and there is really no way of tracking the exact number of orphans that were taken in. We should also consider that these new immigrants had come with pretty much nothing with them to start their new lives in Canada, and when they were finally released from quarantine, they had absolutely nothing. They may have lost a few family members, likely lost their luggage along the commotion, and were probably carrying a deadly virus that could hit them at any minute. So it's not really a great start for them by any means. In 1847, with the mass influx of immigration and disease, this quarantine zone was a major failure on the part of the British government. For the people who also ignored Ireland's cries for help and to assist during the famine itself, they certainly didn't do anything to support setting up a feasible medical treatment facility able to handle this many people at once. And even those who had the foresight to try and prepare could not even imagine what was ahead of them. But we must also recognise that the creation of this station, as horrible as its initial operation was, it did protect Canada from many of the deadly epidemics raging around the world in the 19th century. And perhaps we learned a few things about the concepts of quarantine zones. However dark and however sad it may be to look back, people still lived through this history and it's still important to remember and to learn from. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed and perhaps even gained a little bit of perspective from these horrifying stories of quarantining in 1847 compared to what we may all be experiencing now. Please like, comment and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye for now.